Good morning. These are the words um, written by Richard Rohr. We had thought our form was merely human, but Jesus came to tell us that our actual form is human divine, just as he is. Jesus was not much interested in proclaiming himself the exclusive or exclusionary Son of God, but he went out of his way to communicate an inclusive sonship and daughterhood to the crowds. We were to imitate him more than worship him, it seems. Paul the disciple used words like adopted and co-heirs with Christ to make the same point. The awesome and even presumptuous message of divinization is supported by the first book of the Bible, Genesis, verse 27, where we are told that we are created in the image and the likeness of God. Many tomes of theology, books, have been written to clarify this quote. The word image describes our objective DNA that marks us as creatures of God from the very beginning. It is the Holy Spirit living within us as a totally gratuitous gift from the moment of our conception. Likeness is our personal appropriation and gradual realization of this utterly free gift of the image of God. We all have the same objective gift, but how we subjectively say yes to it is quite different. We already have image. We choose likeness. Thanks, Patty. Beautifully read. Last week, we looked at the nature of peace and that idea that Patty was talking about of the combination of our two natures. In our lives as we go along, it's very easy to see our human nature and to feel our human nature. But I think what we're really trying to say here that our divine is there too. And it's a bit more controversial, the whole idea of the divine nature. I mean, people have written tomes of books about the nature of Christ and the nature of where God exists, both in Christ and in us. And I think here, as Richard is saying, that there is a progressive theology, which actually, I think, chimes with all other religions, which says there is a shared nature here that Jesus has come to talk about those shared natures. It, it says in, in Exodus, as you mentioned, that, that aspect of Exodus, the likeness that we have. And to recognize those two natures that we have is to go back to a couple of weeks ago, is to go through the narrow gate. To recognize the two natures that we have is to go through the narrow gate. It is to acknowledge the existence of other however you categorize that other. It is something more than just ourselves. The existence is something beyond our small self. You know, God, the divine, our ground of being, whatever you like to call it. And I think it's interesting that whatever you culture, whatever culture you come from, we tell the story of that divine, that that ground of being, from our own perspective. You know, wherever you are in the world, wherever you're living, you tell the story of that experience of the divine from our own perspective. To that end, you know, I always see religion as a cultural interpretation of divinity. I see religion as a a cultural interpretation of that experience. You know, it is that experience seen from our own perspectives. You know, Christians see God from the Christian experiences, mediated through Jesus' experience of the nature of reality and how his followers interpreted that. And Buddhists 
see the same from Buddha's experience. They'll talk about it from that nature of that experience. Muslims see the reality through the lens of Muhammad. And each culture defines its understanding of the nature of order. Because really what we're talking about when we're talking about divinity is we're, we're talking about the nature of order. How are we ordered? How is the universe ordered? How, is, how does order come into that? Whether you're a Muslim, Buddhist or Jew, everyone sees it through their own religion. And the way we individually experience uh, the experience of, of the culture within which we exist, because we then take those religions and we, we take those meta-narratives that we have and we all spin our own micro-narratives. I mean, just as there are, you can split up the whole, you know, you can have conservative, evangelical, you have all these different types of, you know, of, of Christianity, you know, all the way through uh, to Quakers or whatever it is. Each of us has our own experience of what that particular religion is. We interpret it ourselves. And we say, well, no, I have not have this bit. I'll have that bit. But yeah, I agree with that. And we tend to gravitate towards the people who have a similar story. But we, we have our own. There are probably, you know, 80 different experiences of the nature of, uh, of the idea of Christianity in this room right now. And they'd all be different. We'd all have a different understanding of the nature of how we, 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 we you know, how we operate. And, th and that changes as our experience of life changes. You know, when our a spouse dies or when, when, when something happens, you know, does it fit within our understanding of the nature of, of, of that divinity? You know, if we lose our wealth or whatever. You know, if it doesn't, we sort of, that is the moment where we reject that particular worldview or we lose our faith, as they're supposed to say, in that particular perspective. And our perspective tends to be reshaped at that point. We, we spin our own religion around the religions that we in turn have been spun. And in that we make sense of the world. We make sense of the order of the cosmos. And you know, we can't really say with, with any certainty you know, what that divinity is. We can, we can have assumptions, we can agree with people, we can do, but we, we, you know, we really have to admit that we don't know. We really don't know how it is. We can just talk about our experience of it, our collective interpretation of it. The following of the golden thread that we've talked about is really the following of the path with that relationship with that other that we're talking about now. It is following the, the thread, is following the path of that relationship. We have to find, and that's why we're talking about balance today. We have to find the balance between our human nature and our divine nature. That, that is the, the way of moving down that thread. It is getting that balance right. You know, not emphasizing one side over the other. We have to rediscover that natural balance, really that we were born with, but we've, we've learned to disregard that balance. You know, the world teaches us that we have to do things in our own strength. I mean, that's really the lessons that we get learned all the way through school, all, all the way, you know, you have to do things in your own strength to get on, you have to make the most of your lives, uh, you have to, you know, it all comes from our heads, from our imagination. I said to my, to my son, you know, what can you imagine you could do with your life? And we do it from our particular, the ideas that we're given. And, you know, I've said this before, but that limits us. If we're simply existing in our own, own heads in terms of our ideas of what could happen, it limits us because our horizons are limited by our imagination. You know, I've said this before, but if you tell me 40 years ago this is what I'd be doing, I'd laugh at you. I mean, I'm really worried if, as, as I was in an advertising agency, you know, I mean, a whole load of different perspectives. And, and this really wasn't in my imagination at all. And my horizon was much more limited as to where the nature of truth and satisfaction was being. We limit ourselves when we do things by our own strength. Not only that, but we also do without that peace. When we're, when we're doing things in our own strength. We're trying to work it out. We're trying to worry it. 
we don't end up with that peace necessarily. That peace that I was talking about last week, I was saying that when you follow that golden thread, you know you're doing it because you feel a sense of peace when you're in that place. When we acknowledge the extent, the existence of divinity in our lives, you know, going through that narrow gate, and then we find that balance between our own strength and, and really letting go into the arms of the other. That's, that's the balance. In heart, part in our own strength and part in letting go into the arms of the other. That's when we find peace. Peace of being ourselves, but both human and in the other. And it's not easy to do always. It's not easy to work out what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. There's a wonderful prayer in the, the King James Book of Common Prayer that, that if you do the King James Communion, you always have to say it week after week. And as we don't do the King James Communion here that often, I sort of miss it, some of it. But there's this wonderful phrase. Um, I don't know if you recognize it. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Anyone remember that? I know Bill does. It's a one, isn't it a wonderful phrase? You have left undone those things we ought to have done. And we have done those things which ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. And actually, there is no health in us. The word insane, insanus, means not healthy. There is no health in us. It is not a, a sane, balanced thing to, to do those things we ought not to have done and, and not do those things that we ought to have done. That's, it's old-fashioned and it's beautiful. And it's so difficult. It, it's so difficult to find that balance in our lives as we go along. So, so, so the question obviously is, you know, how do you find that balance? And... Uh, First and foremost, you know, I always come back to this, you know, the, the place you find that balance, the easiest place to find that balance is in your spiritual practice. That is the place to find that balance. And it assumes you have a spiritual practice. And I am able to do that to, with all of you here because just turning up here on a Sunday is a spiritual practice. So I know you've got one. But, you know, in a meditation practice or in a practice on your own, you know, all, you know, the most valuable insights for me, you know, don't come from me listening, rabbiting on up here. Your most valuable insights, they will come when you're sitting in that practice. And they'll come to you as you use whatever you use, whether it's, it's on the mountain or it's washing up or whatever it is. That's where the insights will come. That's where the still, small voice speaks to you. And say, so, look, I can't recommend strongly enough that you have some sort of a practice that, that enables you to do that. You know, continue to do that. And if you haven't got one, you know, set one up. And if you don't know how to do that, then just give me a call and come see me. And we'll, we'll talk about it in the office. Because it's not a difficult thing to do. And you can start off with three minutes. And it really is a worthwhile. So work out that balance in your practice, you know, letting go. You know, when you're in that practice, you can let go. You can, you know, affirm the existence of other without any distractions. It's much the easiest way of doing it. You can really get into that space. And our part in the, in the process of balance is to affirm and let go. Worship just means worthship. It is, it is, it is giving worth to something. And worship is just giving worth to the existence of other. What we do here when we say, oh, I've come for worship, it's just, I've come here to give worth to the existence of divinity. That's why we're here. That's the nature of worship, is to give worth to it. To, to have a part in your life where you say, I am here to do that. I'm here to give worth to this. And I'm saying, this is important. And just by doing that, you are letting go into something else. The next step in, in doing that, and we're talking about finding the balance. The next step, if, if you could do that in your, you know, just gradually do that in, your, in, your, in your, uh, your quiet life, in the meditation to find that balance. But the next stage is actually to be able to do it in everyday life. And that's equally important as well, you know, to be aware of your feelings, to be aware of your thoughts, to be aware of your tendencies. You know, asking yourself, you know, am I achieving a balance here in what I'm doing? 
And that could cover any eventuality. You know, is the best action here to punch back? That's the question to ask ourselves. You know, or is it to subdue? Or is it to forgive or retire? You know, it, what, it, what is the best way of doing it? Doing things in our own strength does encourage us to fight back. Letting go gives us the strength in order to allow the universe to deal with it. But we have to be sensitive about being led as well. You know, we have to be sensitive about, in all those things, should I take this job? You know, should I go this way? Should I go that way? It's all a bit matter of being conscious of our thoughts and feelings. That balance is about being conscious of our thoughts and feelings, because they can. That still small voice and our thoughts and our feelings. And given our knowledge that there is another, you know, and I think that, that, that is a base point here, that there is an other is a base point here. And given our knowledge that there is another, and, you know, that possibly the universe is a friendly place, you know, how do we act that out? How do we exist in cooperation with that? We, which is why it is so important, you know, the idea of developing consciousness. To develop consciousness is to develop the awareness of those tendencies, where we're we coming from in any given situation. Because unless you're aware of it, you can't actually get to a point of balance. Unless you're aware of it, you know, all the investigation and aid, you know, if, you, if you're not conscious of everything, you will miss something. And when something happens, you know, like the loss or shock of something, you know, when something comes up, what immediately comes up is, is strategies. How do I deal with this? That is, that's the first point we go to. You know, we re that's what worry is. It's rehearsing ideas in your mind about possible scenarios and how we might deal with them. That's the nature of worry. We rehearse strategies. You know, what I must do is I must call my doctor, I must call my broker, see what alternative remedies there are. And this is to go, time to go and find a place of rest, to find that golden thread, to find that response of the divine nature to rest in the middle of the drama and to find a point of peace. To rest in the middle of the drama and to find a point of peace. And, and then the answer comes. And it doesn't mean to say that the, the, your thoughts and feelings aren't relevant. I got an email last week and I, all I wanted to do was to bash back at that email. You know, I had all the strategies I wanted to say in relation to it. To it. And I just paused for a moment and, I, and then I wrote the email and, and I said it to someone else. I said, look, I'm thinking of sending this, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and actually, it was a moment of pause. There are people you can go to, and that's part of that balance, where you can go, you know, you, you're having a, a, an argument over here, and you can go to someone and say, look, yeah, this, and you can bounce off someone. That is so important. You know, to not be in the place where it's most heat, but to go to a place where it's less heat, and just to, to get some re reflection. Not being conscious of all of this going on is to live in automatic. You know, it's to live from our animal brains or even our reptilian brains. Those brains that said, look, I must get this food now and chomp it immediately. I must fight back, you know, flight or fight responses, all that sort of stuff. You know, when that is at the fore, and we're not conscious of it, it is to act out of conditioned response. I need this. I must have it. I will fight. It is mine. All of that's a part of who we are. And if we don't acknowledge the divine in our lives, we remain animals and reptiles. That's the nature of the balance. If we, if we don't do that, we're, we're governed by our learnt responses. To acknowledge the divine is to make us truly human. That, that is what it is. That's what Jesus' message was. Is to acknowledge the divine, is to make us truly human, to move us up the evolutionary scale from animals, reptiles, and everything like that, into humanity. You know, that's what Jesus came to teach us. And, you know, we're talking about the, the human and the divine. The word balance comes from the word by lanks, which means having two scale pans, you know, the scale pans on a balance. That is what it means. It's having two scale pans by lanks. That's where balance comes from.
The whole idea of balance is about dealing with two. It's about dealing with two. And that's why it so aptly applies to life. Buddhism, is, Buddhism has the idea of the middle way. And this is what we're really talking about, that middle way. You know, not, you know, Buddha said, you know, do not have to you know, get all dirty at the side of the road and be in his seat and shave. You, know, you don't have to do that stuff. And you don't have to go and involve yourself in, you know, in self, you know, uh, um, indulgence and things like that. There is a middle way. And, you know, Jesus did exactly the same. You know, when they said to Jesus, he said, they talked about it, and they said, you know, here is someone who comes eating and drinking. How can we call him a Messiah? He doesn't observe the rules. He comes eating and drinking. It is, it is the middle way. It is the balance that's being talked about in both those scenarios. And I think balance is different for everyone. I think balance is different. For, I don't think that I can stand up here and say, this is what balance means. It means not drinking this. It means doing this. No, it doesn't. You know, in my meditation practice, you know, if you go to Centering Prayer, they, they say, oh, you're 20 minutes a day, morning and evening. That doesn't work for me. You know, balance is wherever it does work for you. For me, it works for me to do meditation in the mornings only. Four, I mean, I do it for an hour, and I do it in a certain but that's what works for me. I, I don't do it in the evenings. I don't want to come home and do meditation in the evening. It's the last thing I want to do. I just want, to, I want a glass of wine. <laughs> you know, I just want to come watch, I say, I want to come, I, I, I said the other day, I want to come back and watch The West Wing. I'm only on series one now for the second time, so I, I want to do that. And I don't want to do it every day either. I don't do Fridays and Saturdays, I, I, you know. I do something else. And that is a balance. It means that I'm refreshed every time. And I didn't do it on holiday either, on vacation. I don't, I don't go and meditate on holiday. You know, I, do, I have a balance that's there. And it's, it's different for all of us. I mean, look at the difference, you know, in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, an alcoholic's place of balance for drinking is very different from someone who's not an alcoholic. It, it's their balance. It's a different thing. And in all circumstances, find your own balance rather than be told what the balance should be. It may be coming to, to, to the chapel once a month. But of course, the balance thing is to come four times a month, if not five. And that is really, I mean, that's what it is. People in churches, people want to tell you what balance is. Why should they? I mean, really, you know. In food, in life, in work, it's finding your own balance. And so it's our passage of life, drawing on those two natures, that we have a balance of both human and divine. And here's where I go and contradict everything I've just said. Because actually, do you know, the reality is we're always in balance. The reality is that we're always in balance. And there is, in fact, nothing to do. Like the, man, the story of the man last week holding the rope. You know, our feet are always, actually, whether we know it or not, firmly on the ground. And we don't really have to try. This is really difficult, this, because I've I said all this stuff now, and I'm now saying, you don't really have to try to work it out. You don't have to do that. I I've told this story once before, but I tell it again. I mean, you know, after three years, you're going to hear things again and again. So, but it's worth hearing because half of you weren't here when I said it last time, and the rest of you have forgotten it. So it doesn't matter. And it's the story of the monastery. I always start the story of the monastery. The abbot of the monastery died. And the members of the monastery had to elect the, the abbot. They have to let you hear, you know, I went to the bishop uh, uh, last week on Friday. It's always good to go and see the bishop just to have a checkup, you know, wash, you know, it's like his spiritual health. And, uh, and you know, the bishop's retired, the Bishop of Colorado, and they're electing a new bishop. They elect, in England, they get appointed by the prime minister and the queen, and that's it. But here, they elect... Um, and anyway, in this monastery, they decide they want to elect uh, the new bishop, the next abbot. 
And in order to do that, they erected a huge blackboard in the courtyard of the, of the monastery. And they said applicants were able to write up their ideas on this blackboard. And the ones that wrote up, the one that wrote up the most erudite, erudite idea was going to be made the next abbot. And the sort of deputy spiritual leader came up and he wrote this fantastic thing, a beautiful thing on the blackboard in beautiful writing. He said, he said and I, I've got it written down here what he said. He said that not until every speck of dust is removed. We are like a polished mirror, he said. We are like a polished mirror. And not until every speck of dust is removed from the mirror will the mind become clear and enlightenment attained. He then went on to explain the nature of the mirror, the nature of the speck of dust. The, con you know, the contribution was admired by everybody for its eruditeness. And then one morning, it was discovered that someone had scribbled through the whole passage with chalk and simply written, what polished mirror, what speck of dust. And the head monks, of course, you know, the administrative board, immediately launched an investigation to find out who had done this thing. And they found that the man had done it was one of the cooks. And they immediately made him the new abbot. Because the thing the cook realized that no one else had was that the whole dilemma of the greater self and the smaller self is in fact an illusion. The whole idea, actually, of the human nature and the divine nature is an illusion in itself. There is no dilemma. There is no decision to make because the very fact that you make a distinction between the greater self and the smaller self is an error in itself. We create the idea that there are two aspects of ourself in order to explain the fact that we experience ourselves as being separate and distinct from the greater self. It is an explanation of how we experience reality. They are, in fact, one and the same thing. The reality is that all is one thing, the two natures. There is no fight between the two. There is just letting go to what is. The realization that, we, that everything is all part of the same. And you have to hold this dichotomy, you have to hold this paradox together because we have to live our lives but we also have to know the truth of it. And this really is the essence of the nature of, you know, the enlightenment of what this is all about. And it is the key bit. There is actually no struggle because the small self that worries about being successful is actually the same self as the greater self, the divine nature that is driving everything. It is one and the same. And we don't have to embark on that struggle. We have to let go of the struggle and just be. We have to see the desires of our hearts and our minds and know that they are coming from the same place as the impetus to move towards the greater good. They are both one. And we create a struggle by favoring one over the other, thinking that we have to decide. And the truth of the matter is that we do not. In the end, all our desires, all our wishes will be fulfilled by giving up the struggle and giving up to the desire, giving up the fact that we don't have to fulfill that desire ourselves, which is what is meant by seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. That's what it means. There is only one urge in life. And that urge is towards the greatest good. There is one urge in life, and that urge is towards the greatest good. All other urges are merely aspects of that one urge, aspects of that one urge that we misinterpret or redirect in ways that we think will satisfy those urges, rather than giving those urges into the greater urge towards good. So we see our lives 
you know, as we see our lives, we are conscious of our wants and needs. And we judge those wants and needs. Some we judge as good and some we judge as bad. And then we act accordingly. We say that this is from the human nature and this is from the divine nature and therefore I will do the nobler thing. We have to see there is no nobler thing. There is just what is and all part of the same thing. And that the struggle is illusory. If we could but trust life, we would know that we are always on that golden thread. If Gary was here, Gary Kreutzer, he would tell me that, that when I'm skiing, there's no need to look down. No need to look down. There you go. That's what he said. And it's the same with the golden thread. There is no need to look down to see if you are on that golden thread. You just put one foot in front of the other. To think that we can work it out is vanity. We have to be with a mess. Sometimes we have to be with our messiness, which means devoid of, you know, we have to be with our messiness. We have to put one in front of that. To think that we can work it out is vanity. That's what I want to say. To think that we can work it out is vanity, and which means, vanity means devoid of real value, idle, unprofitable. That's what vanity means. It is vanity to think we can work it out. It is devoid of real value, idle and profitable. Life is a perfect movement towards wholeness if we were to be aware of it. And that's the key thing. The perfection, this perfection, this two natures, this not looking down only really works. And this is the most important thing. All this stuff only really works when you're aware of it. You have to be aware of all this stuff to be able to not look down. It doesn't work if you're living unconsciously. It doesn't mean to say that you can just let go of consciousness. It doesn't work if you're living unconsciously, if you're living from your own agendas. You're still on the path then, but in a way you're fighting it. And that path is always trying to tell you to see the errors of your ways. It's trying to get you back to consciousness of, the, of those two natures and how perfect life is. But if you're not conscious of all that, you're, you're still fighting it. So you have to go through all the being aware of the two natures in order to get to that point where you say, the struggle doesn't matter. So you have to go through all that first bit, I said, to get to that point where you realize that there is no mirror and no speck of dust. And unless you realize all of that, you don't get to that point. Once you realize that there is no struggle, that there is just the experience of rightness and peace. There's not even balance, because balance needs two to exist, and there is only one. There is only one. You know, as I've said before, there are no others. As someone said at Davos, there is only us. I and the Father are one. That's what Jesus said. True non-duality does not have an opposite. There isn't an opposite. So know that there's nothing to do, nothing to work out, and that your life is perfect. You're never off the golden thread. And to know that is to live in true love and peace. Let's pray. We pray for our world and pray for the consciousness that we've talked about here of all it is to be truly human, to live in that oneness, to live on that golden thread, to live in that balance. We pray for our leaders in the world that they may understand the nature of your contribution, the nature of that larger self. We pray for peace in our world, especially pray for those who are in difficulty in prisons or anywhere that there is somewhere that they are struggling with. We pray for our town, pray for safety around the X Games, for the participants, for the travellers. Pray for our police, our first responders, all those working today on the mountains and visiting. Pray for our valley, those in difficulty here. And particularly pray for those that we think of today. From our community, Tricia Nichols, Patricia Hill, Will Welsh, Barbara Orcutt, Tegan Sutherland, 
Mary-Kate Brewster, Soleil, Lee Bouguet, Betty Vanderveer, Gary Daniel, Sandy St. John, Ivan Kassar, Irene Gubrud, Father Joseph Boyle, Bill Archer, Alice Davis's niece, Lindsay. We continue to pray for the family of Elise Strickland, for Dee Dee and all around Elise. And we also pray for David Franklin and the family of Royal Franklin, David's dad, who died yesterday in hospice. Pray for David and Shelley as they go down to, to make the arrangements. Lord, we just thank you for all we're given, for our ability to think about these things and our consciousness of these things. Pray that you guide us as we walk that golden thread. Amen.